I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you experiencing victory in your life? Are you the same person that you were five years ago? Are you the same person that you were a year ago? Have you and I become comfortable with sin in our life? Morning, church. This morning's uh, scripture reading is from Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he, shall, so that he will not hear. May the Lord add blessings to this word. This morning we'll be taking a one-week diversion. You know, we've been in our Ten Commandments series, and we've covered through the Fourth Commandment. And today, since we're having communion, we're going to be doing, going in a little different direction today. And we'll pick back up next week with the uh, Fifth Commandment. But, um, you know, uh, from the time I was probably ten years old or so, uh, up until four or five years ago, I always owned and I rode motorcycles. To be more precise, dirt bikes. That's all I ever owned was dirt bikes, and I've ridden them all my life. And, and growing up, my brother and friends and I, were, so when we were young, we would ride in the country around the home where we lived at that time. And there were hills, and there were trails, and there were creeks to cross, and mud holes to play in, and, and all sorts of things. And lots of fun places to ride motorcycles where we live. But unquestionably, our favorite place was on the power lines behind our house. And on this power line, or this string of, uh, this long power line extended for miles and miles, there was a, a set, a, just a string of hills. And we named them, uh, each one of them had a name, starting progressively from our house, moving further away was hill one, hill two, hill three, etc. And we gave one of them, the very last one, the furthest one from our house, uh, it had a, its own special name because we could never seem to climb that hill. And so we named it appropriately Hill Impossible. Hill Impossible was different from all the other hills that we rode on. It was not only steeper than the other hills, it was covered in loose gravel and even some bigger rocks from where they had uh, put the power line in. And, and it just made it impossible to ever seem to get a grip with your tires and to keep going. You could only go so far before you ran out of momentum and you just stopped there on the side of that hill and you start sliding back down. And so we made our attempts to climb it time after time after time with seemingly no ever, not ever going to have any success. And so day after day, though, after school or during the summer when we were riding, we would ride to the bottom of that hill. We'd make our way over the other hills, and we'd stop, and we'd look up at that hill. And we would see that thing. It was almost, uh, it, it, was, it was intimidated us, and it defied us. And throughout the history of man, we have been afraid of giants. We have been afraid of things that are bigger than us. Something, there's something fearful about an enemy that's larger than we are. You know, if you'll remember, as the children of Israel were um, about to enter into the land of Canaan, they sent spies out to search the land. You remember, when the spies came back, they came back with reports of giants in the land. And the people were refused, they were afraid to try and go any further. In fact, Numbers chapter 13, 31 through 33 says this, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. All the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The Israelite nation came to the place where they were willing to give up the promised land because of their fear of facing the giants. This was the land that God had promised them. They had been waiting and longing for, for generations after generations. And now they are at the very verge of it, but they refuse to go in because they're afraid of the giant. Maybe today, 
you're facing a giant or I'm facing a giant that we can't seem to overcome or maybe we are unwilling to face. What is your giant? One author put it this way. He said, your giant doesn't carry sword or shield. He brandishes blades of unemployment, abandonment, sexual abuse, or depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of Palestine. He prances through your office, your bedroom, your classroom. He brings bills you can't pay, grades you can't make, people you can't please, drugs you can't resist, a career you can't escape, a past you can't shake, and a future you can't face. What's your giant? This morning, we're going to focus on the fact, as, we, as we're going to have our communion service uh, afterwards, we want to focus on the fact that Jesus died to pay the price for our sins. And I want to focus on not only on the fact that Jesus died to pay the price, he died also to give us victory over sin. And I want to focus on three victory strategies this morning to help us face and defeat those giants in our lives. But first, let's pray. Lord, again, we come humbly before you, um, come before our maker, our creator, our redeemer, and I pray, Lord, as we do so, that we will um, come with our hearts open to hear from you. We're praying for your spirit, Lord. We're begging for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we're asking you now, if you would, please speak to us as we humbly Ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. This is one of my favorite Bible stories in the entire Scripture. When I say story, you know I mean historical account. This is not a children's story to tell kids to help them to overcome their enemies. This is a real-life account that took place. But we're going to look at this, the story of David and Goliath, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to begin in verses 1 through 4. And since it is communion Sabbath and I'm shortening the sermon, we're going to have to read some verses and, and kind of skip forward a little bit. We won't cover the whole story today, but I sure want to get the gist of it. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Reading from the New King James says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Soko, which belongeth to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekai and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits, in a span. The first victory strategy I'd like for us to see from this story this morning is to be able to face and overcome and defeat our enemies, we first have to recognize who our rival is. Now, as these Israelites were standing there on one, va- on the, on one mountain, there's a valley, they're seeing the Philistines on the other side. It's very obvious, no question, who their rival was. The Philistines were their enemy in this story, and in particular, Goliath. But notice in verse 4 again, it says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. He's the champion. He is the big dog of the Philistines. He has a history. You know, and, and that's significant because a lot of us, we have a history with the giants in our lives. These giants didn't just show up this morning or yesterday morning. They've been around our lives for years and years. Maybe they started back generations ago. And when you look back on the history of the Israelites, Joshua had destroyed, he and the Israelites early on had destroyed all of their enemies some 300 years before, except for the inhabitants of about three cities, Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. And so Goliath shows up to the pep rally here of the, of the, the Philistines with a big G on his letterman jacket. He's from Gath High School. And Goliath is to Israel what Lex Luthor is to Superman, the Joker is to Batman, and what the Cowboys were to the Indians, and what Wiley Coyote was to the Roadrunner. And so the Israelites recognize this big G on his, on his shirt, and, and he, he's got a history with Israel. You know, his people have been terrorizing the Israelites for centuries now. And perhaps your giant has a history with you. It's something you've been struggling with day in and day out, and day in and day out for weeks and months and perhaps years. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says this, Let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What is it that you or I face from day to day that tries to prevent us from entering the heavenly Canaan land? Who or what is that Goliath in your life or my life? Now, I think we might all answer correctly the devil or Satan. We could say that and that would be right. It's true. He and his evil associates, the, the, the fallen angels, they're at war with us, as we know from Revelation 12, verse 17. Uh, but, you know, to be able to experience the victory, like we said, we first got to recognize who we're at war with, right? Satan is the giant in our lives, but he manifests himself in our lives through sin. Sin is the actual enemy that we all have to fight with. Sin shows up every day in our lives, and it flaunts its power over us some, from time to time, and it reminds us constantly of the history that we have with it. But you know what just happened is society has eased the burden. Our culture has now given a name to almost every sin. You find a sin in your life, we go to the doctor with our sin, he gives it a label, he gives you a prescription, and we're good to go. And so then we have a reason for our sin. Then we have an excuse, and that takes us off the hook, and it relieves us of our responsibility. Listen to what Oswald Chambers says. This is on June 23rd. <clears throat> he says, We have to recognize that sin is a fact, not a defect. Sin is red-handed mutiny against God. Either God or sin must die in my life. If sin rules in me, God's life in me will be killed. If God rules in me, sin in me will be killed. There is no possible ultimate but that. That's the bottom line. God or sin. We call it dysfunction. We can label it as a disease or, 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 or do or say whatever we want about it. But sin is the problem that every one of us faces. Sin put Jesus on the cross and ultimately it is sin that separates us from God. As we saw from our scripture reading earlier, uh, Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. There's the good news. Nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But here's the bad news. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his faith from you so that he will not hear. You know, as I spend time studying the Bible, there are two things that always pops out. in almost anywhere you go, any story, whatever, and there's two things. The one is that God loves us, and the other thing is that God hates sin. That's the bottom line. And if we don't recognize who our rival is, that it's sin, how can we face it, and how can we overcome it? Desire of Ages, page 29 and 30 there in your bulletin, it says, While the Jews desired the advent of the Messiah, they had no true conception of his mission. They didn't seek redemption from sin, but deliverance from the Romans. Thus the way was prepared for them to reject the Savior. The Jews weren't looking for redemption from sin. They were worried about these, those oppression they were facing from the Roman government. They wanted deliverance from the Romans. They weren't even thinking about sin anymore. All those sacrifices had no meaning to them anymore. Because they were looking for the wrong thing. They'd forgotten this idea that sin is what separates from God. And I wonder sometimes if we don't stand a chance ourselves of missing it the second time around when we don't remember and understand what sin is doing in our lives. When Jesus came, he came as a savior from sin. Matthew 1, 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their what? You know, this is foundational and simplistic, but Jesus saves us from our sins, not in our sins. Not from Rome, not from dysfunctional backgrounds, not from debt. He saves us from sin. And although it is true, 100% true, that Jesus will save us and deliver us from all those problems and all those things that we face in this life daily and the heartaches and challenges that we have when he comes, but he is ultimately coming to deliver us from sin. You know, thousands of people are divorced every day, not because of incompatibility, but because of sin. People are put in jail every day, not because of some broken law or the fact that they didn't have a father figure in their lives, but ultimately because of sin. And you know, we, we refuse to accept responsibility these days, and society cheers us on. You know, as I said earlier, we label our sin and we place the blame on our parents and our, 
upbringing, our hormonal deficiencies, and we say we're born that way, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, is that we need to recognize if we are ever going to get a handle on this, that our problem is sin. The problem that I have is sin. And it may manifest itself in a different way in my life than it does in yours, and vice versa. But the thing that I struggle with, that I'm going to have to have victory with through the blood of Jesus, is sin. You know, if we want to overcome the giant, we've got to first recognize the rival, and we also have to recognize our responsibility. You know, just kind of fast-forwarding a little bit from verse 4 to, to uh, verse 17 and verse 20. You know, we find that David, he's one of Jesse's eight sons, and three of the, the three oldest boys are gone to the military. And look and pick up with me now in 1 Samuel 17, verse 17, and then verse 20. Then Jesse said to his son David, David, by the way, was the youngest son, he says, Take now for your brothers an ephah, this dried grain, and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And then verse 20, So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took these things, and went as Jesse had commanded him. Notice the submission that David had to his father. And we, too, we have to learn to come submissively before our Father. We've got to learn to submit to God and His will and His word. And notice also, I thought it was interesting how it says He rose early. Early in the morning, it says. He didn't sleep late the next day. His father said, you know, I want you to take these loaves and these things to your brothers. And, and, and David didn't sleep in late the next day. It says he rose early in the morning. He didn't, didn't drag around, and he got about his father's business the very first thing. He didn't wait and just let it happen when he got around to it. And, you know, if, if we're going to be ready to face the enemy, we've got to learn to rise early and meet with God. It is in the quiet times with God that we gain the courage to face the enemy. It's in the quiet times that we have personally with God that we, we gain the strength for victory. It is through those times and those times alone where we gain the power and the confidence to be able to face these giants in our lives. You know, David wasn't afraid of this giant because... He knew God through those quiet, meditative times he had alone with, with his father in heaven. Notice that David was about his father's business. What his father said, he obeyed. And, you know, sometimes I think we, 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 we think we can respond to God whenever and however we want to. We can take our time and everything's going to be all right. But when we think our time is unlimited sometime. Look at this, this quote, Desire of Ages 587 says, in every age there is given to men their day of light and privilege, a probationary time in which they may become reconciled to God. But there is a limit to this grace. Mercy may plead for years and be slighted and rejected, but there comes a time when mercy makes her last plea. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God, then the sweet winning voice entreats the sinner no longer, and reproofs and warnings cease. You know what happens when we don't respond to the voice of God? The voice that we once heard clearly, instructing us and trying to teach us and trying to give us guidance in our lives, it grows quieter and quieter until we no longer hear that voice anymore. And you know, once that voice that was loud and clear, it, it, it grows dim as we neglect to follow it until finally it's silent to us then. And so we've, we've grieved the Holy Spirit. And if we want to overcome the giant, if we want to be able to face the giants in our lives, we have to be about our Father's business, and we've got to recognize our responsibility, and we've got to go about gaining the victory in Jesus wholeheartedly, of course, only through His Holy Spirit. You've heard of uh, Alan Shepard, the astronaut, and, and he was one of, the, one of the, the first guys to travel in space, and they interviewed him later, and they asked, what was going through your mind as you were strapped there uh, in that, that aircraft waiting to be shot off into space? He said, what would, they asked him, what was going through your mind? And he said this, I just kept looking around me, and I quote, I just kept looking around me and remembering that everything in the capsule was supplied by the lowest bidder. Right? 
lowest bitter lives. You think God wants us to live lowest bitter lives for him? David was about his father's business. We've got to recognize the responsibility of being about our father's business if we want to overcome the giants in our lives. And when we are about the business of God, when our lives are surrendered to him, we can expect to gain victories in our lives as well. We left off in verse 20. David was taking food to three of his brother, brothers in the military there, and then he arrives. We're going to go to verse 32 now. David arrives, he hears Goliath giving those taunts to the army of Israel and, and Israel's God in the process. And so look, look with me there in verse 32. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're a youth and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Doesn't that kind of pump you up a little bit when you hear that, the way he says that? He is confident because he, is, he knows God. He has seen how God has worked in his life before, and he knows the victory is imminent as long as he continues to trust in God. Life Sketches 196 says, We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Nothing to fear for the future. As long as we keep remembering how God has led us in the past. You've got to hang on to those little things sometimes. Or remember those little victories, those little ways that, that God worked for you that day. And, and God came through for you. And God delivered you. And keep those things in your mind and store those up. And it, and it builds your confidence. If those 12 spies had remembered how God had delivered them from Egypt and all the miracles that God had performed as they were making their way through the desert, um, they could have marched victoriously into the land of Canaan rather than, than wandering for 40 years and dying in the desert. But they didn't remember. They didn't continue to trust. And when the enemy comes to you, whatever that enemy is, we have to accept the challenge. Not in some bold, uh, devil, I'll take you down. I, I've heard people, you know, threaten the devil before. I mean, don't be foolish. But realize, when the devil comes at us, if God be for us, who can be against us, right? When the enemy comes, accept the challenge. And if no one else in Israel is willing to stand up for God and fight for the victory, then stand by yourself if you need to. You know, when the Israelites face these earthly... Uh, we're, we're about to enter the earthly Canaan land. Only two men were not afraid of the giants, and that was Joshua and Caleb. Sometimes you can't wait for your family to do the right thing. You can't wait for them to, to follow the Bible truth. You know, so many people are going to lose eternal life because they're waiting on a spouse or a daughter or a friend or a son or a daughter we have to take a stand for what is right. It doesn't matter who else takes a stand. I think it's interesting as we compare the army of... If you look later on at the, and look at uh, Saul's army compared to David's army, and maybe this is an insignificant thing, but I thought it was kind of interesting. David's army had three giant killers in it. You know how many giant killers Saul's army had in it? Zero. You know why I think that is? Because David was a giant killer. Saul wasn't. You see the history of Saul. You see the history of David. David believed in conquering giants, no matter what anyone else thought, and he was a giant conqueror. And he had giant conquerors in his army. Don't let anybody discourage you from following God and his word and his will once you understand it. Goliath defied the armies of the living God. And Satan, brothers and sisters, defies the children of God before the unbelieving world when we as Christians say that we cannot overcome sin in our lives. You hear what I'm saying, right? The soldiers of Israel and those ten spies said more, listen to me, about their belief in God than their military ability when they said that the giants were too much for them. 
right? They were saying more about what they thought of God than what they thought about their military might. When we live defeated Christian lives or we say that we can't overcome sin, we're saying that God cannot overcome sin in our lives. You know, I wanted to sing, and we're going to sing, Victory in Jesus is our closing hymn after our, we come back from our uh, uh, foot washing service in, in, a, in a few minutes. But um, victory in Jesus is not in our hymnal. We don't even believe in victory anymore. We don't even put it in our hymnals anymore. So I got it from another hymnal, from a different denomination. And we're going to sing it. It's going to be on the screen in a little while. But we've, we've grown accustomed to sin. We, we've learned to live with it even in the church. But we have the promises of God and we have the power of God and His Holy Spirit to help us face our giants. A couple of promises you're familiar with. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you such as is common to man, but God is faithful. I happen to read it because I have it memorized in the King James and I have it on the New King James. So if I quote it from memory, you guys go, he doesn't know the verse because it doesn't say that up there. No temptation is overtaking you such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the will with the temptation, uh, here I go, King James, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Philippians 1 3, you know this one, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? To overcome the giant, we must recognize who our rival is, and second, we have to recognize our responsibility, and third, and perhaps most important, we've got to recognize who the real conqueror is. After David speaks, go with me if you would, to uh, verse 42 through 45. <clears throat> After David speaks with Saul about fighting Goliath, and you know, he, he tries on Saul's armor, and he doesn't, he doesn't like it, and he takes it off, and he goes and he chooses these five stones from this brook, from the, and he puts them in his sling, and he goes to face the giant. Now pick up in verse 42. It says, then David, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword. Listen to the way he says this. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord doesn't save with sword and spear, for the battle is who? The Lord's, and he will give it into your hands. The battle is the Lord's, brothers and sisters. The battle always has been and always will be the Lord's. Every victory that we gain is only by the grace and the power of God. We have to recognize who the real conqueror is. I had people sometimes tell me, well, I've, you know, I've got some problems I need to work through. Someone recently told me this. You know, that they're ready for a commitment to, to baptism, but they, they've got some things they want to work through before they're ready. But you, you don't... You don't overcome sin to become a Christian. You, you overcome sin by becoming a Christian. It's Christ that empowers us. Don't get me wrong. We need to get our lives right before we make a commitment to Jesus. But we've got to get, or we've got to recognize, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm following Jesus all the way. Philippians 1.6, we've talked about this a couple of times lately. This is such a beautiful promise. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, David went boldly before Goliath, but he didn't gloat over the victory. You know, if I'd have been David, I'd have... I'd have I know, tell them what I've said to those Israelite soldiers, all those grown men back there who were unwilling day after day after day. This is Philistine, uncircumcised Philistine, he calls it, comes before him and, and taunts the Israelites' army and taunts their God, and, and they just take it. I'd have, if I was David, I, you know, who knows? Sissies, girly, who knows what I'd have called them? But David knew who the real conqueror was. I remember when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian 27 years ago. So this marks the time where I was a, a Baptist Christian 27 years. Now I've been a, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian for 27 years. So I'm in the halfway point right now. Um, but anyway, I remember when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I, and I begin, the Lord began to give me these victories in my life of things that, you know, I would have never even, you know, weeks before I wouldn't even thought, I wouldn't even worried about. 
They were, I was okay with those things in my life. But all of a sudden, the convictions began to come, and the, and the vic, God began to put His Spirit in my life and, and, and be, began to have victory after victory. And, and things were so dramatic in my life that it was, it was unbelievable for me at the time. It was like, wow, I can't believe some of these things are happening. And over time, I began to compare, compare myself to some of the other church members, people who had been here. I've been in the church a year, and we, these other church members have been here for 20-something, 30-something years. Look at them, and look at me and I was looking pretty good to myself but God has a way of humbling us Archbishop William Temple said and of course he said it tongue in cheek he said I believe in one holy infallible church of which I regret to say that at the present time I am the only member and I kind of felt like that. I was that one, you know, you know the 7,000 there that hadn't bowed, you know, uh, Elijah thought he was the only one. He said, no, there's 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And I thought I was that one for a while. But God humbled me. And the story's actually so humbling, I'm not at a point I want to share it with you. Maybe another time. But I did hear a story about Muhammad Ali. And the story said that Muhammad Ali got on an airplane and the stewardess came to him and before the takeoff and said, sir, you know, you, you've got to fasten your seatbelt. And Muhammad Ali, you know, his quick wit, he says, you know, Superman don't need a seatbelt. And the stewardess replied, sir, Superman doesn't need an airplane. <clears throat> God has his ways of humbling us. And he humbled me. Another story, another time. And what I began to do is to realize that I can be as hard on myself as I want to be. But I have to be easier on others. The battle is the Lord's. Victory only comes from God. You know how the story ends. Look in verse 48 through 51. <clears throat> so, it was, excuse me, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. David kills Goliath. He defeats the giant. He faces the giant. Friends, we don't have to live defeated Christian lives. You know, it's only by the merits of Christ that we will ever be righteous in the eyes of God. But once we realize our, that our sins put Jesus on the cross, we can't say that we love him and continue to persist in those things that put him there, right? For no other reason than sheer love for what Jesus has done for us, we should want to put sin out of our lives. The Bible says that the love of Christ constrains us. And you know, when you hear the word constrain, you know, it's in the, in the King James Version, you just think it kind of it holds us back. But it actually means the opposite here. The word means it, it's, it impels us. It's the, the wind beneath our wings. The love of Christ is what, uh, it, it pushes us forward is what it does. And when we think of what Jesus has done for us, we ought to want to live right. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you experiencing victory in your life? Are you the same person that you were five years ago? Are you the same person that you were a year ago? Have you and I become comfortable with sin in our life? Are there things we continue to struggle with over and over? Don't be discouraged. Do like David. Grab hold of the rock and gain the victory. And that rock is Jesus, of course. This morning, we are standing, brothers and sisters, just before the gates of the heavenly Canaan land. We're there. We're no longer waiting for this, you know, 100, 200 years, and maybe Jesus is going to come. We're on the verge of the kingdom. We've got to make some choices in our lives if we're going to enter in. There'll be no one entering the heavenly city that is not an overcomer. The giants, we can't allow them to hold us back any longer. My friends and I, back to our original story, we finally climbed Hill Impossible. We didn't do it on the first try, and we didn't do it without some scratches and some bruises and some wrecks, 
but we finally climbed that giant. We finally overcame that giant. And God wants us to face those giants in our lives. He wants us to be so connected to Him that sin and all its attractions holds nothing in comparison with the beauty and the holiness and all that Jesus has for us. I want to be so in love with Jesus that there is nothing that I would allow or I would want to allow to come in between he and I. What about you? What about you? Lord Jesus, I'm grateful today that um, there is victory in Jesus. And, and so, Lord, though we have been facing this giant in our lives, we have a, a history with it for many years for most of us. But we believe, Lord, that you can and will and want to give us victory. And so we're praying for that victory for those giants, whatever they might be. And as we separate now, may this special ordinance of humility and the, and the communion service as we come back together, may this uh, commemorate in our minds what Jesus, what you have done for us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.